G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. Today we're going to be reviewing round 12, the first of the buy rounds, doing our bogs and flogs, talking about the targets coming off their buy and answering a lot of your questions. Let's go! G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. And joined, as always, by the co-host of the podcast, Luke Rogerson. How are you, mate? Sickly. Sickly? Sickly today, mate. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been struck down by a devastating, devastating case of man flu. Oh, so. mate. Well, I, I, I put a tweet out to say, obviously, we're recording this on the Tuesday. Normally, mm. we record on the Monday evening, but... Uh, I thought it was because you uh, were just taking solace in Hugh Greenwood and, <laughs> and just being empathetic and, you know. Yeah, poor, poor bastard. It hit got, you hard, that, that, yeah. that concussion to he one got, of your players. He so. got crushed. Did you actually see the footage? Oh, I didn't miss. I missed that game. He got um, fallen on. It was like a, a marking pad. We'll talk about it a bit more later. But yes. uh, no, just a head cold for me. I, I bloody curled up in the fetal position at like 5 p.m. last night and went to bed. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm feeling a little bit better today, but um, always better when we're talking fantasy, isn't it? Of course, mate. Hopefully it's a, a good remedy for you to, to feel a bit better afterwards anyway. so But we appreciate you you fighting through the man flu. We do I know, obviously, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very serious condition that, that we <laughs> all need to work through. Not to so. be underplayed. Not to <laughs> so. be underplayed. But let's, uh, let's get stuck into it. First of the buy rounds, we've got a lot to cover, a lot of news and things like that to, to yep. get through. But first of all, let's maybe just review the round by going through our favourite segment. And the winner of the Norm Smith medal. You're an embarrassment to what you do, mate. You're an embarrassment. <laughs> always That's funny, Sarah, yeah. Sarah Grab always gets me, love that. Classic Bevo, <laughs> but we've got a few games to go through, a couple fewer games than normal, but starting on the Friday night, Melbourne versus Carlton. Uh, I've got the bogs this week, so best on ground goes to my boy who <laughs> stepped up when he needed to, Jacob Van Ruin with a big oh. 77, uh, his best score of the year, right when I, I need him on my ground on the buy round. So that was clutch in the buy rounds, wasn't it? This this Melbourne Carlton game, just as an impartial spectator, uh, oh, how the, boring! It was a boring game how to watch. Dull. I don't want, I don't want to cast any shade on either of the teams, but it just felt like I'm sure um, the Carlton fans. Uh, I mean, I've I've seen a lot of talk about it. That they're, they're yeah. not, you know. I think they're pretty aware of how, how their team is going up, just Car- like we were aware as a Richmond oh, supporters correct, correct. how and, poor we were looking. And Carlton have got such great players. We just want to show, like, want them to show some dare and some dash. Yeah. You know, Sard come off the back line and stuff. So They've got the talent, uh, absolutely. But, man, yeah, now, the game style. Anyway. Speaking of someone with talent that didn't perform, and I know his owners will be very unhappy as Walshy. So he's, yeah. our, he's our flog for this game. If you're a, a Walsh owner, things have been reasonably good up until now. Uh, but I think uh, I, I heard that maybe that was his lowest score of his career. Yeah, I think, I, think uh, I did hear statistic. Destroy say something about that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. That's pretty crazy. And, and mm. look, I believe it because of how gun how gun of a play he was in yeah, his yeah, first yeah. season. But yeah, 55 points. Um, yeah, just not going to get it done. One mark, two tackles. Uh, gave away a, f- a few free kicks as well. Um, you know, playing off that half forward line a little bit more. So not really in the CBAs. So without the DPP... And now with a poorer role than a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, not yeah. probably not the time to be jumping on Sam Walsh, but again, someone will monitor. He will uh, be losing cash. But for owners that have him right now, uh, that's not a good way to start your, your first buy round. No. Now, this next game we were watching a little bit of, and this, this looked like it could have been a 200-point oh, dropping at one point, Oh, yes. I think they definitely let the foot off the gas, Port, Port Adelaide, Adelaide did. But they, that first quarter, man, just... They, they'd kicked 100 points by half time, and, and one of the guys that was leading that charge was your, uh, your bog in this Yeah, time. bog. Zachy Butters has been, obviously, we both jumped him. Did we jump on in the same round? I think it might have been oh, the same week. Uh, I think so. so I went and Siebel and, we, and were, we obviously got a first couple of 80 scores, but since then, he's yeah. just been amazing. He's right up there in the Brownlow. Uh, votes at the moment. Zach Butters, since moving into the midfield round, uh, midfield role, which was actually a couple of weeks earlier than we brought him in, he has been averaging 108 points, and that was in round four. So I think he had a couple of games in there. The one against the Bulldogs, I think it was at the um, the gather round, was the mm. one that sort of alerted us, and we sort of went okay, and we got him in on round six. 
Uh, but since round four, he's averaging 108, which would rival some of the best midfielders in the game. And uh, a lot of people were a bit worried about his body and stuff like that, but he's just been a, a great pick so far and uh, has been soaring up in price. So. Oh, he's found some continuity, and I don't think there was ever an argument that he wasn't going to be an elite player. It was just whether his body could could stand up to the rigors of footy. So he, He's definitely taken it up a notch, in my opinion, though, in terms of his... Um, that like that comes that comes with the continuity, but yeah, once you, you string yeah, a few weeks together, you get yeah. that confidence. So now, um, looking on the other side of things from this game, Will Day was the flog that I've got in here, and and um, this is an interesting one because there there was a scenario probably prior to his suspension where we were sort of talking about, hey, this guy's a great pick, and he could go on to be a top six defender. But it, are we thinking about? Him not being a top six defender now? Like, what are, what are our thoughts? There's so many guys in that bracket, aren't there? Yeah, look, he's... Look, from what we saw before his suspension, he was right around that mix, at least. He's probably not in that top echelon, but he yeah. could be in that mix for that, that five and six sort of spot. Um, the one thing I do want to draw our attention to is he was actually getting tagged in this game as well. So, you say the flog goes to Will Day. The flog could very well go to Will and Drew, <laughs> who was tagging him until, Sorry, he, Will. Sorry. until he uh, until he moved into a half-back role to sort of get away from that tag in sort of the last quarter and a bit. So, do, um, do you see that as an issue, but g- given that he was is probably firming as one of the best players there at Hawthorne? That, yeah. That, but also... Why, why, why are we tagging them? Like, and, and they You're kept by 100 points. And they kept it on him. Like it, it's not like yeah. they let it go, which was which is very interesting um, sort of move by them. Look, I still think he's probably going to be a guy that averages between like 90 and 95. Yeah, which um, is good enough. Which is okay. I line. think when when it comes to post buy time, like I don't think he's someone that we necessarily he's not a high priority in terms of trading him out at his buy. Yeah, which is in a couple of weeks. Um, I'd still be trying to make genuine upgrades from like. A mid price are, you know, if you jumped on a Hobbs or, yep. or you know, a rookies um, in that round 12, uh, 14 buy, so sorry, be might, making that upgrade. But might be a luxury season. But he, he's probably maybe, if you get him to someone, like a lot of us have Doherty, not a lot of us have Sicily. You know, if you can get him to one of those players, I think they're clearly going to be better than him, but it's maybe down the priority list at this okay. stage. Yeah. Now, I've got a sneaking suspicion that you might want to do both the bog and the flog for this next game. So I might sit back and just let you go to town. On well, this well, first of all, they, they kind of coincide with a trade that I did this week, <laughs> which I'll get into in a, in a second. But the bog for this one, Darcy Cameron, he came out and had a great game, 109 points. Um, we sort of highlighted him as a good player to, to bring in, um, you know, does some things with our, our ruck line yep. in terms of, uh, covering that over the buy rounds was at a really good price, six hundred and sixty thousand or so. Um, someone who we'd seen the the role improving, so he came out, did what he needed to do, and and had a weird quarter by quarter breakdown. I don't know if you saw this, but he had like ten points in the first quarter, fifty points in the second <laughs> quarter, seven in the third, and then forty in the in the last quarter. So. Look, if it wasn't for those like first and third quarters, you could have had an absolute monster of a score. But still, one hundred and nine for a guy that you paid less than seven hundred thousand. It's a great return, in my opinion. So yep. he's the best on ground. The flog, and I'm going to dub this. His, this is the flog of the year so <laughs> far. Uh, flog for a is multitude of reasons. It just affects you. <laughs> Jordan Dugowie. Uh Okay, this is going to start my little rant. Jordan Dugui, um, just the bump. Like, what were you thinking, mate? Oh, like, it. It just now. I've got a question for you as a as a person who's probably played football at a higher level than. You know, well, definitely a lot higher level than I have, and my under twelves are one season of. <laughs> you were best on grand the grand final, mate. Oh, I actually, you know that. what? Maybe I'll, I'll take that back. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, what's why bump? What why bump in that scenario? Is there actually like a football advantage of bumping instead of tackling? Yeah. Or is it just laziness? Um, is it like what, why bump? I, I haven't played for a few years, but when I was playing there, there's definitely this notion of when when a player gives that hand pass over the top or kicks the ball, you stop their run on by like yeah. laying what we used to call, I don't know if it's the same, but we used to call a bumper bar. Yeah. And so in that instance, they've disposed of the ball. Um, you obviously can't tackle them after they've disposed. And so you lay a bumper bar. So you don't bump. want to give away the but free for holding the man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but what he did is, you know, to be fair, it's not a bumper bar. He's like, <sighs> that's a full-on bump. And oh, I think... His shoulder's connected right with his chin. I knew the second that I saw <laughs> oh, that. Like, bad. as soon as I saw that, I've... I've my, my heart sunk for you because I knew that yeah. you, you traded him in. But, um, yeah, I think, like, players... 
players can have brain fades, yeah. and I think this is one of these situations. So I, I don't necessarily agree with a heap of people who've come out and absolutely like crucified him for it because players yeah. players make silly decisions. It's, it's a split second kind of thing, right? It is, yeah. but oh, it, and he's it's got a reputation, obviously, which um, you know people will jump on. It certainly hurts. Now I, I don't think I think uh, in terms of your particular trades and how it impacted you it, it sucked but the Dugowie trade was kind of separate to your main move it's not going to absolutely kill me yeah so the, the thing that kills me though is the fact that I was weighing up between two different players <laughs> from the same team oh hindsight hero I know I know I know and <laughs> and look I put this tweet out like and I I'd actually scheduled the tweet to come out at the start of this game <laughs> because I knew that it was going to be you know a, a hot take or whatever and yeah I talked about it last week and I'd follow through with it the whole time and Straight away, you know, I mean, it's, it wasn't even long into the game as well. It was like five minutes into the first quarter. He's on negative four at this time of the game. Yeah. And um, everyone's like, well, that, that went up in flames, that sort of thing. But <laughs> I stand by the logic, right? Because the week before, he scored 127 against North Melbourne. Yeah. Um, you know, he's on the round 14 bye. I traded Warpool to get him. Someone commented to say that it's the wrong week to trade out Warpool, which I thought was, you know, a weird take of the trade. Oh, <laughs> but it's... Anyway, like it could have, it could have been good had I gone the Tom Mitchell, which was the yeah. other way I was going to go. And if that was the case, people would be calling me a genius. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be, a, you know, I'd be ahead of my time. Do you know what I mean? But I, I, I traded the wrong guy. Look, yes, obviously that's a fail. That's a flop of a, of yeah. a result. But it's like it's funny. The, the, what we love about the game, it's all opinion based. It's all like a lot of the stuff you're doing you're going with your gut on particular trades and stuff and so it's good fun like last week you know you you was we were both a bit smug because we'd missed a lot of bullets and then <laughs> yeah it's come around to bite both yeah, of yeah, us yeah. so uh it's all it's all part of the fun I, i'll cop it you know call me an idiot whatever i don't i don't mind <laughs> I've Look, been calling i, you an I idiot took a risk years, and mate. people saying i'm sideways in premiums and that's not it and that's whatever like i stand by that obviously i i use that as a cash grab to make money he's going to become a premium for me this week but Anyway, the other other thing on top of this, he took out one of our rookies to be oh, in, Hewitt. in Hewitt, who we were watching could have maybe potentially got a few games yeah. for us over the buys in a struggling side on the Eagles, but <laughs> no, he's gone. Um, so all around to go, he just flogged behaviour. But yeah, man, if if you don't laugh, you cry. Hey, let's <laughs> yeah, that's it. let's. In, but so the, we good, don't... the good news is oh, though, he's sorry, back. one more, one more. <laughs> His score didn't count for me. Oh. He, he, his score actually got dropped off my team. So, I think Greenwood's got dropped off my team. So, too. yeah, it, uh, at the end of the day, it didn't hurt me as much as maybe it would have on an, another round, but anyway. Oh, man. Anyway, oh. to go eat, see you later. You're out of Mitchmond, and uh, you won't be coming back to my team. I'm, I'm cracking up. Uh, we got to move on, otherwise you're going to blow a bloody poo yeah. anyway. Um Bulldogs in Geelong. Who was your bog? Uh, bog, pretty easy one here. Timmy English. Oh, uh, funny story again with this one. Did, did the ball boys... <laughs> I've got stories all day. Uh, did the ball boys, big boys, and um, normally, obviously, English is a high, high appropriate. Like, he's literally of, a big boy. He, he's a huge boy, right? And just forgot him in my in my side. And and it took someone commenting on the oh, look. I've got receipts. It took someone <laughs> commenting like, "Oh yeah, what about English against Geelong?" And I've looked at my my list there, and I've gone, "Oh fuck." I've forgotten English. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so... You've had a mare, mate. You've I've had, had a mare with that one. So obviously he would have made my list. I definitely... He would have made that top four that I was really no, keen on. No, you should on. have just put him in one at hindsight, yeah, mate. Yeah, hindsight, he was one. <laughs> he would have made my top four, but if you did go with him, obviously you were rewarded. Um, I don't think many people did this round because he, I think uh, he's had a poor run against Geelong, but he's obviously yeah. put that to bed for oh, now. Yeah, the dogs haven't, but but he certainly has. But yeah, now, obviously, best on ground. Interesting floggish behaviour here because this guy actually pumped out a 130, and oh, I didn't even realise this until I went back and looked at the stats today because yeah. I was I didn't watch this game, and I just saw that you tweeted out Trelaw hamstring or Trelaw down to the rooms or something to oh, that yeah, extent. Yeah, I think he went down. And, and, I, and I just thought, oh, man, put, you know, poor Trelaw, he's done. And then yeah. I just looked at the stats today, 130? Yeah. Like, How's he going down to the room? Eleven to pop tackles. The yeah, yeah. So, what did he go down to the room to get into the peptides or something? So I like, think I think he went down going? to the rooms. Uh, might have been an ankle or something like that. Oh, so he's got jabbed. Um, got, got jabbed. Come okay, back gotcha. in. But so, okay, yeah, I just played out the game. I immediately um, thought Trelaw soft tissue. But yeah, yeah. So I, just yeah. don't. The only reason I've given him the flog is just don't make your owners ride the roller coaster. Adam. Well, I thought. Well, no one. I don't think anyone owns him. But the other right. reason I reckon he deserves a flog is that McRae. Bailey Smith. Oh, yeah. Out of the CBAs. Uh, people have them in their that fantasy was team. Spicy so, take, yeah. They didn't quite go all the way to your spicy take, but yep. uh, the role definitely obviously went south compared to the last couple of weeks as he was out of the team. What about some boggery from the Gold Coast Adelaide game up in Darwin? Uh, bog, best on ground. I've got a value pick, which a lot of people were talking about last week. I 
unfortunately, I put my hand up say I was probably wrong here. Poo-pooed the idea. Ben Keys uh, is best on ground. Absolute amazing game. And if you if you brought him in, um, well, props to you. He's gone up fifty-seven thousand dollars. His break-even is now twenty-five. He's put up a massive score of one hundred and twenty-three. His biggest of the season. Kicked two goals. Uh, laid ten tackles. Just an all-round excellent game yeah. for him. Um, I'm sure we're going to get some questions on whether or not he's someone to bring in later. But if you got him in last week, uh, brilliant pick because he repaid the faith immediately. Now, we were up in Darwin for that game and we thought that it would be just a sweaty cuddle fest. Oh, yeah. And it would just be He's like, had 10 tackles. <clears throat> we thought it'd be prime lady conditions, didn't Absolutely. we? Absolutely. We're both bringing in Laird this week as well. And yep. um, despite what we've been told it feels like to be a Laird owner, it certainly didn't feel real good in Haven't week one. have felt it yet. <laughs> so, yeah. I know Bale's, Bale's actually... His poor, second poor. lowest score of the season. His lowest score outside of this game yeah. was round, round one. one. Yeah. So. Well, poor bloody Bales actually apologised to us. You don't, <laughs> you don't need to apologise, Bales. We're making our own He's calls. He's the lead ambassador for he, the whole community. Oh, he is the lead ambassador. Yeah, takes and, it personally. Um, you know, rightly so. But uh, no, I, I don't think that that's going to be indicative of what Lady does for the rest uh, of the season. I think I, I heard someone say, and we were watching the game, but maybe not super closely on a Saturday night after, you know, a couple of poor results. I was in my feels about the Dugowie thing. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> He apparently was tagged after quarter time by oh, okay. um, uh, David Swallow, I think is the reporting, because he had a good score, I think 29 at quarter time, and obviously finished with 81 for the game. So I think there was some reporting that Swallow went to him after that quarter time. So hopefully... I hope that doesn't become a blueprint, because Gold Coast went on to win that game. So yeah. you hope that... Uh, we keep saying that Dawson, tag Dawson, he's yeah. the guy. Yeah, um, but, but maybe in those kind of conditions, it's, it is worth tagging uh, Rory Laird, so... We'll see. Um, GWS versus Richmond. Another, again, mid-pricer pick that absolutely went off in the first uh, round of people bringing him in. Kieran Briggs. Um, we were saying just before we started recording, he's got that role now. Oh, he's, man. He, it looks like he's he's the number one runner. I don't know why you'd be playing around with Flynn or... He looks really good. Kicked, uh, he's kicked a goal in every game he's played so far this season. Big um, imposing man. Big imposing player. <clears throat> tackles well. Yeah. Um, so I think he's just uh, a guy that they're going to run as their... Number one ruck, whether it's a solo position, I would imagine stays there for now. But great return if you went, especially those Sean Darcy owners, you went down to him. After like that English um, score on the weekend, you're probably thinking, fuck, what have I done? I should have oh. just gone to English. Yeah. But if you did go to Briggs, I think hopefully use that cash to do something else. And it probably was the, um, with hindsight, the, the move to make. Mate, there's, there's a scenario where like he's put up, I think it's 300s in a row now. Um, just fact check me on that. Yeah, but maybe one like, was... 90 or something like that. So let's say he's GWS's number one big man now. Mm. If if this is the kind of stuff he's capable of, like, what's to say... He's gone 84, 111, 117. So, like, what's to say he doesn't go on to... Well, look, I'll, I don't think he's going to be, like, you know, top two Ruckman or anything like that, but he's probably capable of averaging, what, 90 mm. from here? He's going to make you some cash if you, if you go Absolutely. on this Absolutely. Well. So his break-even's 12 again. He's made the most amount of cash the, uh, this week, 72,000 in that's, one week. See, that's the shitty thing for the he rest of us. He could go on and do, it, do that again. He could make another 60,000 in another week. Yeah. Um, he, he'll get to 700,000, 750 really fast. Wish he was a ruck forward or something like that. Yeah. Um, now, from that game, Floggery, this guy's not really a flog, but I'm just sick of the fact that we didn't pick him to start the year and he's just pumped out. I think he's the second highest averaging player in the game or he's in that realm and Tom Green pumped out I think a 115 or so for owners so he's not a flog but I hate the fact that he's not in my team so yeah, Tom we, Green I'm, like, I'm actually rooting against him every week and uh, it's terrible to yeah, say isn't it rooting yeah. against players but but well for my fancy I'm not wishing injury on the man but I just hope that he you know spends a bit of time on the bench or something like that you know <laughs> rest just up hoping those sort of things happen but uh, let's move on to the last game Essendon versus North Melbourne best on ground um, this man I, th- I believe he's probably got it three weeks in a row but mm. Zach Merritt um, we needed a captain to come home Bro, um, didn't we, we had the VC on Laird yep. and almost in a strange way lucky we did because my other player that we were talking about on the Friday show was Dacos mm-hmm. and Dacos was going to be my VC but we switched it to Laird. You would have taken that. I would have taken though. 114, so I think. I. Um, and had I gone Laird and not got that VC, I probably wouldn't have gone Merritt, who won 55 last game of the round. 
my ranking, I think, at that point was in the mid two thousands. Um, he clutched I've, it, didn't he? He clutched it. Biggest score, um, biggest captain score, I think I've gotten, or maybe the Marshall one a few weeks ago. But this one felt better because I don't think everyone went him. Some people went Taranto, which he put up a one thirty, and that's the thing. We were, we were. So you I know, was, but he puck it up tighter than a snare drum there when Taranto went one thirty, and we were relying on on merit. It actually got me. Um, I was messaging Holmesy. Um, from the pod pod and uh, it probably got me over the line in that match or two fair yeah. after Greenwood went yeah. down. So probably same for myself um, as well. So poor, buddy, poor Holmesy can't um, catch a break at the minute. But yeah, um, Merritt, well done. Now flog for me is just straight up whoever fell on Greenwood's head because <laughs> I, I was just It's a good pick as well. He's mate, looking nice. Talk about Greenwood. I had a hardwood at half time because <laughs> he he what? was playing very, very well. Forty nine points and then just before they flashed to the bloody halftime ads, my hardwood became a softwood very oh. quickly because... So it was right I, on the halftime. Yeah, I, so basically it's like 10 seconds to go and they'd obviously, they've wrapped it up, the siren's gone and then just before they cut to the ad, it flashes to basically like Greenwood's on the ground like this oh. and he tries to get up and you're just like, no, that bloke's cactus and without... They, they said, oh, we'll come back and we'll confirm he's gone down. I was like, they said, don't worry about worrying about when yeah, you look done. like that on live yeah. television, you're not coming back on the ground. Oh, um, good. So there would have been a, you know, a few owners that got on, so that was disappointing, but um, that's part of the game. Yeah, it's part of the game, and obviously, like we said, luck plays a big part in the game, and, and we're seeing it a lot. Like I think, again, the community, the, the competition as a whole, everyone's getting wiser. Obviously, we're all learning from the great man Selby, who's put out this blueprint. We're all kind of picking it up and running with it, and um, it's getting harder and harder to do well in this game, and I think a few people have mentioned before, but luck is having an increasingly bigger imprint on the results of the, the comp. So chalk that one up and, and try and do your best to just move on. Now, we're going to talk some news from the weekend because you've spent 15 minutes talking about Dugowie. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk some news. Sorry, I cut you off there. But That's all right, mate. <laughs> let's all get good. into this news. <laughs> uh, so a couple of things we'll talk about here that will affect um, what we're doing moving forward. But mm. Clayton Oliver is the top, uh, well, the number one story on the list here, he's expected to be back this weekend against the Pies. Definitely someone that I'm super keen to watch, first of all, and potentially target after his buy. So Round 14 by hey. Yes. I'm just uh, While you go on to the next one, if you want to yeah. no, yeah. do that, I'm just going to double check if um, many of the top 1,000 have sort of held on to um, yeah. a Clayton Oliver and, or if anyone's jumped off, which I imagine most people would have. Well, something that we want to, while Mitch checks that out, something we want to talk about again is the fact that Hawthorne threw those magnets around a little bit. So I think that um, maybe last uh, weekend in isolation, that game was a little bit uh, interesting in, in sort of the fact that Port Adelaide got off to such a big start. But, you know, Dylan Moore... Uh, was a guy that they flicked around a little bit there. Obviously, you mentioned Day yep. previously. He went back he went to, to shake the, the tag, which yep. kind of helped his scoring a little bit at the end. But I think that'd be something that we kind of watch over the next couple of weeks to see whether that's a trend or whether that was just something that um, Sam Mitchell did. Yeah, so a lot of these, like both Hawthorne and Melbourne, um, both have the round 14 by. Yep. So we're watching these teams this weekend, not as like oh, we're going to jump on them now, but to maybe do something after their round 14 buy to get them in for our squad for round 15. Yep. So Dylan Moore, for example, we talked about a lot of those guys uh, in the round 15 by the forward line. Yep. So if we see this weekend Dylan Moore come in and he's in the midfield, well then he's a cheaper forward line that's going to be there for round 15. For idiots like me who trade out <laughs> Errol Goulden, you might be able to jump on someone like that and plug into your forward line and yep. at least hold down that position for a little while until you get him to a big dog. Um, or he might stay that way and you sort of ride that until the, the situation goes. The tough thing about the last game was they put him in there and in my opinion, they looked way better, but Port Adelaide probably also took their foot off a little bit. Oh, and, um, you know, so it's, it's hard to sort of decipher how much of that is just, okay, they've changed up their mix and they're going to ride this through a little bit more yeah. or did Port Adelaide just kind of let them into it and it's sort of a false Yeah, I'd love to know... Of, um, Success. I'd love to know whether um, the fact that we want to see uh, Dylan Moore in the midfield, um, it, whether there's a fantasy bias behind that. Like, I'd like to hear from yeah. Hawthorne fans uh, who are just looking at it from a footy perspective. Do you guys throw your hands up and think, why is he not in there? Or can you see? So if you you know want to comment below and let us know, that'd be legendary. Now, some more news. We talked about it, but Dugowie is going to the tribunal. We reckon three weeks. Um, yep. I think that's pretty much where At it least. is. It's not. Yeah. It's not three to four. I'd that. say. But I also do find it a little bit interesting. Like cast your mind back to earlier in the year when Cosy Pickett knocked over Bailey Smith. Oh. I think what did he get one week? Didn't two. He? two. He got two weeks. Two so weeks. if if Bailey Smith gets up just like 
Because well, he bounced and, straight back exactly. up. Exactly. If he yeah. gets up seeing stars and he's out for like a week or two with concussion. I reckon that's worse. It almost looked opinion. worse, but, um, and, you know. Well, the other thing I was going to think, I wonder if <laughs> I wonder if Fox 40 or KO are going to use this bump in their advertisements <laughs> and things like that, like they've been using Cozzy Pickett for the last two months. <laughs> like, what are we doing, guys? Uh, anyway, so. Uh, but, yeah, I think If it's I a, see that, I'm going to lose my shit, though. It's, it's a three-game minimum for Degoe, so keep that in mind if you were uh, one of the suckers that traded him in. What else we got from news-wise, Mitch? Uh, just on that game as well, a uh, couple of injuries from um, uh, Collingwood. Collingwood as well. So Will Hoskin Elliott had knee injury, and I think Bo McCreary also had an ankle injury and was on crutches. So uh, does I that mean Shaggy? The airport. So Harvey Harrison, who we're dubbing Shaggy, based on his, um, his profile photo in the AFL <laughs> Fantasy app, um, it, it, does that give him some short-term job security as a guy that maybe, even though he's got a, his buy next week, is he someone that maybe we trade in this week as a cheap downgrade option? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. Um, Potentially a play. I don't know how good I feel about it because, like you said, he does have a buy to come um, yep. and job security could be shaky, but I need some cash. I need some cash yes. money. Yes, we do need some cash. And, again, he's a forward eligible player, so if he is there for round 15, it is someone that we can throw onto our ground at least to make up the numbers. Yeah. So I think there is a, a world in which it is um, a play. Maybe just monitor the AFL.com's um, sort of injury reports yeah. and, and what they are there and how long those guys are out because that might help us That's correct. Uh, sort of see where he goes. But I think Jamie Elliott is also another player that's going to come back into this side, which he was probably in there to replace in the first place. Yeah. Um, we'll see. So we'll see how it goes. Elijah Hewitt was obviously can cast from that to go. He hit. Yep. He's obviously out for next week. And I think then they have their bye the week after. So he's not going to be back until at least round 15. Um. We talked about Trelaw before he was back in. Caleb Daniel had zero CBAs. McRae but was, still scored well, was down. I think he moved into defense. Okay. Um, and I think there was another injury. Was it Ed Richards also got Did injured he? as well? So okay. Caleb Daniel and Bailey Dale might get a little bit of a boost from that. And then obviously Bailey Smith also had a reduced CBA role. I think he only had like nine out of 30 CBAs. Yeah, he so and McRae were around um, that mark, weren't they? Yeah. Probably, if you have them, you just got to write it out. If you don't have them, I would be waiting until that changes yeah, before, before bringing them in. Or Ed Richards, six weeks, I've just read. Yeah, so, yeah. Good couple player. of Good player, couple Ed of Richards. defenders for the dogs down. So, that yeah. Bailey Dale move that we, we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. Oh, man, if could, people got on it. Could come really good. Yeah. Um, going to the next couple of news from the Suns, um, Rory Atkins. A lot of people are going to talk about him as a trade-out option. He has had a role change in his last couple of games. So... Played a defense before, but Joel Jeffrey has come back into the side. Playing forward previously has now moved into defense, which has pushed Atkins onto the other wing from Braden Fiorini. I don't know if that's good for Atkins, to be fair. I don't think it's good for him at all. No, um, I think I'd rather that, him in defense. That cheap pill. But I did see something that was good for his job security. After they won that game, he, he dapped up the coach. He got a big, you know, oh. one of those... Yeah, you know, little bro, you bro know, kinda, shakes. Yeah, like, yeah, I feel yeah, like okay. an old person. Bro shake, cuddle in. I thought, Ooh, oh, okay. Hang on. He's in Stewie, Stewie Jew's little circle. Or maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe Stewie Jew just thought he was Matty Rail or something. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're oh, sorry. Atkins. Go over there. <laughs> yeah. um, so, look, it's going to be something that we'll talk about in terms of um, the chopping block later. Yeah. But I think that it is important to note that at least for the majority of this game, there was some talk maybe he went back at the end and junked it up a little bit. But for the majority of that game, he did have a different role. Um, I think Brennan Ellis is still not in that side as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a few different moving parts there. I'd rather Ellis on the wing. Than uh, the I personally would too as well. Um, we talked about Swallow. He went to Laird after quarter time. The other thing in the next game that we're talking about tags, Marlon Pickett for the Richmond um, Tigers tagged Rosie, I think it was, the week before. Yeah, yeah, Didn't yeah. do a hell of a job, but they... That was a one and done kind of thing, it seems. So yeah, that was weird. Important when it t- when we're talking about captains and things like that. Um, just making note that Pickett didn't do any tagging, moved into the forward line. Richmond yeah. got a win. So I'm crossing my fingers that that was just kind of a one game experiment thing. Yeah, Pickett kicked the winner too. Yeah, he did. He did actually. So yeah, looked good in the forward line. Uh, took a few good grabs as well. So I think at least for the next few weeks we'll <coughs> persist with that. And then along with the Hugh Gridwood concussion, Jai Simkin also um, was concussed as well. So a couple of players out of the ruse. It looks like LDU was a test for this week. And also as a result of that, during that game, Taron Thomas got a bunch of CBAs in the middle as well. And uh, yeah, I guess maybe one to monitor well, as a cheap guy. The only problem is round 15 buy. Yeah. It was, a, it was a few years back that he had that big end of year run, wasn't it? Is, I think he went like right 105 post buy, I think. Two or three years ago, yeah. So, 
He's, maybe, play, he's playing for his footy life. Maybe one to think to about. Um, but yeah, maybe more so just to monitor at this stage, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but LDU also is potentially back this week with a couple of those guys going out. And as much as we've been burnt in the past, he is, he is bloody cheap. I'll tell you that much. Oh, for sure. You ready to throw the headband on? Let's throw the headband on. What give have we got? Give us the sound effect, mate. Oh, fuck. Which one is it, actually? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, let's do this one. <laughs> oh, you went on the back. I went on the front of the head that time. I don't know. What, what the hell was we that? We were in sync, though. We were. <laughs> Shopping block. Okay. Another tricky round. Yeah. Round 13. Different to most years because... Now we'd be just trading guys out on their buy, yep. getting them to guys who have already had their buy, doing that simple little upgrade. But this year, round 13 is the good buy, yep. as everyone's been calling it. Yep. You've got Gold Coast and um, Geelong players. So we'll talk about some players on the chopping block. Some of them we'll talk about them. So, But the obvious ones are your red dots. So players who are out, Greenwood, I think. Chop, he's gone. Can, can we dig more into that? Because this is the thing I, w- I was going to sort of ask you about. It, it sucks because, you know, he's going to have his buy as well as the fact that he's out this week. But because there's the potential for me to field a heap of guys this week and Without hold him. him, is there like a scenario where you entertain holding a guy? I, I Yeah, I. there may be a scenario, like say Greenwood comes out and from now he's like a, a 90 averaging player, which I think is... You could expect that reasonably if he stays in that um, midfield role. Yeah, it could be a then goal. for his price, he's underpriced. Yeah, he's definitely has the potential to outperform that price tag. Where I would sort of hedge my bets the other way is to say that well, he's missing this round concussion. Yeah, he's going to be there in round fourteen. Sure, that might help you that round. Then he's got another buy round. He's got the shittest buy round. He's got the shittest buy round. He's also <laughs> not a player that you're going to have in your side as, as a completed side. He's yeah. not a keeper. He plays midfield, so he's a good 20, 25 points away from the best in that line. Yeah. So the value of him helping you in round 14 and being there after his buy, it's just kind of not worth the headache. You'd just be holding him for one game. You're holding him for one game. In price his break deal. even is still low, but it's not low like it was last week where yeah. it was like 15 or 10 or whatever it was. It's 46. Um there's uncertainty with players like LDU coming back yeah. in. You know, he's out as long as uh, Simpkins out. Yeah. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So for me, like you just cut your losses. The upside is not worth the potential headache. So All I right. think that he's a pretty clear trade, I in my s- opinion. I think you summarised that pretty well. Um, similar story with Dugowie. He's probably out multiple weeks. So he's not going to be there for your buy round. So get rid of him and yep. cut your losses there. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone else. But say you have like a Simpkin or something like that. Yeah. Same kind of story. Yeah, true. Yeah. Those guys you get rid of. Um, we just fall into talking about the guys that are in our team. Oh, right? bloody hell, yeah. <laughs> no one wants to know about our team, mate. Yeah, <laughs> well, apparently not. Um, but other ones there, non-playing rookies. This is a little bit of a grey area. So you, you had red dots like Drury, Roberts, Fleeton. In my original plan, I was hoping to get rid of some of these guys. What, what if you, So let's talk about those red dot rookies. What if they just can't make you any money? So a guy like That's Drury, like, what's he, he's like 230, 220, could even be... Yeah. So 220 he, is Fleeton. I think Drury's 234. So he costs the same as, as Shaggy. He costs the same as... Um, it's a sideways, sometimes McDonald. an upgrade move. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so are you considering turning those guys like a Fleeton or Roberts? You're in, thinking of turning them into like a Johnson from Fremantle or or no? What's the, the way I would... If, if you have an extra trade and you can turn... If you could do an upgrade with two moves and with your third move get one of those red dots to a um, a guy coming off their buy. Okay. So a Johnson is the guy that we're sort of going to be talking about yeah, a fair bit. He's like 360. He's like 340, I want to say. Yeah, okay. um, so you're paying up. You're probably paying $100,000 yeah. to do that. Shit, that's hard. Um, then I like that. But the thing that a lot of those basement price rookies have yet to have their buy. Yeah. So do you go to a Harvey Harrison? He plays this week. He's not there the week after. Who knows if he's there for round fifteen? It, it's a it's a nothing move oh, in my opinion. It, it's really it's really not it's not really what we want to be doing because it doesn't help you all that much. So you have to it's a really cash. tough spot. So I think I, I only tick those ones off if you have to get to a player that's coming off their buy okay. and at least 
they're there for this round, and if they keep performing, they're there for the rest of the, the buy round. So I like that. Or if there's a rookie that you are really just gung ho on, like you think this guy's the yeah. dude, like I don't the know, dude, like, I don't know. If you, if you looked at Harvey, and you watched bro. Harvey Harrison's uh, game, and you went, "Yeah, this guy," and you're a Collingwood supporter, <laughs> and you've got a bit more insight to us, and you think, "No, nah, he's in there for the next six weeks." Then you do that. Oh, I just don't know if I see that player out there. If if you see McCreary, Hoskin, Elliott, Dugowie, and you say, okay, they're not going to be there for the next couple of weeks, is it a move that you're then more uh, bullish on? Potentially, yeah. And there's there's a world where it, where it pays off because we need cash still. We still need cash generation yeah. because the thing that I'm struggling with my team, and again, not harp on my team too much, but to make those upgrades, the luxury upgrades, like I'm going to run out of cash on my bench players to, to do that, to facilitate that. And with the rookies not coming through in terms of those cheaper ones, yeah. it's hard for me to do that because these guys that are red dots are not not generating cash. My team value is slowing down. And this is a good segue because I noticed the next dot point you've got in there, but your your move last week was Gould and to Cameron essentially. And, yeah. you know, th- that move was sort of brought from that, that point of not having... Um, cash generation happening so much on your bench that yep. you think, okay, well, if I can I didn't want to get rid of like a Wilmot, <coughs> for example. Yeah, exactly. So like you, you're thinking, okay, if I can get rid of Gulden at the top of his price cycle, yeah. pick up Cameron at the bottom and get a top six average yeah. in forward, um, that's a good way and to still generate still get an cash. upgrade from a rookie to a premium mid and lead. Yeah. So that being said, talk to us about this next up point that you've got here, Zeebel and Sheasel. Talk so to us about those guys. <laughs> this, is, this is, again, and I'm considering a move like this. So... Uh, Two weeks in a row. You yeah, are spicy, man. Well, it's it's not even like... I don't know. It's it's It doesn't fill me with confidence and I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have to... Well, if I had other options. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm less feel good about this. But a, a, a Zeebel, for example, he's priced at... What is his price? Um, he's priced at 854000 His break-even is 138 At a priced-at figure in terms of an average... Zebel is priced at, what is he priced at? Where have I got him? He's priced at 101, okay? Do we think that he's going to do that for the rest of the season? I think, I think that's overs. When I traded him in, I had him projected at about 92, I think was what I was expecting him okay. to do, or 90 to 92. He then went and did that 168, yep, which inflated. was massive. Um, so he's obviously been great. But he probably, in my opinion, is a little bit overs. He's got round 15 coming up. He's 32 years old. So he's a guy that you could potentially make some money. It's not much, but if you compare a move of like a Zeeble to like a Jack Sinclair, Sinclair is 830K. You're not making much. You're making about 24K. But it's the same amount of money you'd potentially making from one of those red dot rookies to like a Harvey Harrison. Yeah. And... Again, you've got question marks of whether Harvey Harrison's going to be there in round 15. The difference is, though, is like if Harrison is there, then he's going to make a whole lot more money, yeah. whereas Sinclair's not going to make a whole bunch more. He's probably fairly priced, in my opinion. But the value of Sinclair is that he's already had his buy, so you're picking up an extra round of scores. Um, the, the Sheasel thing is a little bit different, though, in my opinion. Now, he's probably not someone, by the looks of things, that he's going to be best 22, yeah, but the difference with him is he's actually probably priced more fairly, in my opinion. So he's only priced at seven hundred and seventy-two, so about seventy thousand cheaper than a Zebel. And if you put them side by side, like who do you think averages more Zebel or Sheasel the rest of the season? Maybe you say Zebel, <laughs> but I'd but be, maybe be, not much. I'd be guessing. Yeah, I'd be a guess. What do you what do you think about if I wanted to make a hundred k this week? What about? Oh, I was going to say Sheasel to like Darcy Cameron. I know Darcy Cameron has the round 14 buy, so you yeah. only be getting him for a week and then he's getting a buy. But at this point right now, it makes you 100K cash. I reckon two weeks from now, it's not going to make you, it might even cost you. That's a very, it's a tough one. I think because the strategy we said, and we'll go into our trade target soon, and we're going to talk all about round 12 buy players. Yeah. I still think the strategy of getting round 12 buy players this week trumps trading in a guy who potentially looks like a great play and okay. they've got to buy the next week because there's a few guys like that. So would, um, that be, would that be the perfect play coming off? So Sheasel has round 15, Cameron has round 14. So coming off the round 14 buy, 
that would be a good play, do you think? Like a Sheasel to Cameron type thing? They're going to be probably similarly yeah, priced at that Yeah, I think that might be a better play yeah. than doing a Zeebel to him now, yeah. if that makes sense, and making okay. that cash. It might be a bit more of a sideways move, but it, it's tough. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't have that crystal ball in front of me, but it's sort of the way I see it is that a player like a Darcy Cameron, let's use him as an example. You'd get the benefit then of the of covering English on your ruck line then as well if you went Cameron on that week you going would. into the round you 15. Would. Which was why he was such a good um, buy last week because <coughs> everyone still had a buy coming up. Yeah, Darcy Cameron's got a break even of 76. He comes out and does another 110. He's not going up all that much. He's yeah. still going to be under 700,000. So in round 15, he's still going to be a good buy. And you'll still make money going from Sheasel to he's him. He's still going to make money. Like, Sheasel's break even is not quite as high as a Zebel. So his break even is, I think, 117 I, from memory. And you you would do that trade as part of getting an upgrade somewhere else. Do you know, like, yeah. do you know what I mean? So the, the end goal at the end of the buys is to have your team full of premium. So even though it's doing like a Sheasel to Cameron might feel sideways, it's a cash grab to then hopefully get you an upgrade yeah. elsewhere with those It might be trades. that 70K that, right? that you need on top of potentially like a Chin Carter down to yeah. uh, another rookie. Just so that might only make you 150,000. You might need an extra 70K to get, you know, that fattened rookie or mid-pricer up. Yeah. And that might be the way that you can facilitate doing that. Okay. It might not work for every team and you might actually just have to wait until luxury trade season yeah. because I think uh, it's just a little bit awkward with the guys coming off the buy rounds and if Sheasel or Zeebel or whoever it is puts up another poor score, their price will start to come down uh, pretty quickly. Our hope is that this week Sheasel gets close to that 100 again, only goes down a little bit, does a similar kind of thing next week and maybe over the next two weeks he loses 20 or 30k it's yep. not a huge hit um, but if he puts up a couple of poor scores and goes down 50 60k it's going to make that move harder to do yep. um, so Far in that juicy. scenario you might just have to hold him and hope that he comes good or, or potentially we just look to start to upgrade him later so it is very awkward um, I prefer if you're looking at trading out either one of those two I think Zeebel's the one to go okay. simply because his break even's high and he's got more money on his head so you can probably do more with it um even though Zebel maybe is probably the guy you'd say averages more from here on out, I think that the fact that his price is going to go down quicker and he's got more money on his head, you can do something a bit better to it. So I'm tossing up whether or not to do maybe like a, a him to a Sinclair or him to a Hayden Young or one of those other guys coming off their buy round. Yeah. Um, make a l tiny bit of money, get an extra weeks of scoring, potentially get a better player in the long run as well. And then hopefully that 20 or 30K I can use somewhere else. Instead of doing like a little red dot fix up to a rookie that I don't even know is going to be there in two weeks. So that's the question for me. Now, we're sort of talking chopping block here in, in combinations. You've got yeah. Fiorini and Atkins as the next couple of guys to talk about. Was, was the intention of having these guys to ride them all the way through the buys? I think... It's, it's kind of an interesting uh, discussion point because I think when we were buying them... When, when other people were getting them into their sides, you sort of like use the round 13 as like a selling point for them. Yeah. But I think in my opinion, that was always, if if everything went well, it's like that's the home run pick. Yeah. The, the round 13 by being a positive was more, in my eyes, applicable to players like a Tom Stewart, a Noah Anderson, a, keeper. a Matt Rowell of, you know, if you believed in him. Like those guys that you wouldn't mind being in your team at the end of the buy rounds. Um <coughs> so for me, Sorry. those guys, uh, they've done their job. You got them in at a time where they were very cheap. Rory Atkins is 547000 You probably got him at about four hundred k. He's made nearly $150,000. Cool, that's great. Cash it in. I think you cash it in now, yeah. despite him having the good buy, because at the end of the day, he's a guy that you're going to want to upgrade. Yeah. So why not upgrade him now when he's not contributing to your team? And if you get him to a round 12 buy player... Well, then he's going to do. They're going to fill the same amount of buy rounds. It's true. Anyway, so so you might cash him in for a guy like uh, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do the same thing. Johnson's going to play the same amount of games um, that contribute to your buy rounds from here as Aquins would. Um, so that would make you about three hundred thousand. Oh, sorry, two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, which is good. You can then go and throw that one hundred ninety one on, on top thousands, of someone yeah. else. Uh, yeah, and so you could do that and Fiorini up. So something like that. So in my opinion, just because they're on their round 13 buy and the original plan was that if all went well, you'd hold them through the end. I wouldn't let that stop you from getting out of what is clearly 
a sinking ship in terms of um, you Cash know, F- Fiorini is is going backwards in price. Yeah, um, so he's he's probably someone that a lot of people actually jumped off him last week. We had him on our chopping block last week. I think that he's a guy you get off now while he's on his buy and just cut your cut your losses. Especially if you've been able to get all that cash, Gene, because even even if you, you're running with that notion of, no, nah, ride these guys through their buy, like you said, it's irrelevant now because you can trade in guys off around 12 buy. But yeah. the other thing, you could get to the end of the buys and think, shit, I, I haven't actually made much cash off these buys. <laughs> That's right. They, well, well, actually, I think, I think Braden Fiorini... I think I probably bloody lost cash on him um, when I traded him last week. So After his 112, and a lot of people got him in... That week eight, he was five hundred and fifty nine thousand. He's five hundred and eighty nine thousand. So he's only made thirty thousand from that trade. Yeah, um, that was probably me. I think. I think. Did you trade him last week? I got rid of him last week. So, so. he was six nineteen. So you made, made what fifty k? Oh, it still doesn't feel good, but yeah, does it? fifty k on that move. Um, if you trade him out now, you've made thirty k. If you trade him next week, he might actually be below than what you purchased him that for, and he's hurt. done absolutely nothing for you. That so, um, I think that you get rid of him now and try and get him up to a premium, in my opinion. Um, uh, Bailey Humphrey is a different story because I think he is still generating cash. Yeah. So my plan for him is to hold him. He's got a low break even um, at thirty five. He's someone that I think that. If you have him, he's a guy that I'm playing to be there yeah. around 14, 15. Good player to root for as well. He's, he's quite a talent, isn't he? Oh, he goes for it, doesn't he? For sure. Um, last little dot point you got here on the on the chopping block is just kind of those failed or topped out mid prices. So guys that fit into the mould like a Kennedy, a Warple, a Peddler at this point. Yeah. These kind of guys have done what they need to do for you and they're, they're your, they're your um, springboard, aren't they, to, yeah. your, to your underpriced premium. And, and a lot of these guys won't be on their buy round. So you might be thinking, oh, well, I'll wait to trade them on their buy round or whatever. But I think it's fine to go early on these guys because they've now done their job. Now 12. that you can bring them in around yeah. 12. Um, and also now that they might not potentially contribute to your best 18 scores anyway. Yeah. This round in round 13 is all going all to be about ceiling. And if yeah. you can get the best 18 with a high ceiling, that's yeah. going to put you in a good round now. And if you can get a round 12 player in that will help with that, they're going to be there for the rest of the buy rounds and you might be ahead and maybe you can trade rookies on their round 14 yeah. on their round 14 buy. Well, the, the point that you make about these particular guys maybe not contributing to your, your overall score is a good one. because you So you got rid of Warple and got into Goey. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think Warple did an 80, Dugowie did a 40, but Dugowie's score dropped off. So, like, maybe you only still, had you kept Warple, you stood to gain, like, maybe. So, my lowest score was, my lowest score was 68. So, I think. What, 12 points. So, it'd be gain. about 14 points. I think Warple got uh, 82. 82. Okay. So, I lost 12 points from that, that trade. Yeah. And, and he had a low break even, so his price just stayed the same. So, so it's like, um, yeah, th- these p- this is potentially the time to make those trades because, yeah. like you said, you can hide behind that a little bit as long as yeah. you don't have too many stinkers. Yeah, exactly. I lost, <laughs> I lost 12 points in the absolute worst case scenario. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so that's like, there was always a risk in that. Yeah. The upside was he goes 120 and I make 40 points on that. So, and I drop a bunch of cash. Obviously that didn't happen, but the logic is there and that's why uh, those sort of things happen. And again, while you can, you can cut bait on those mid prices now to try and get that high ceiling guy with a good matchup this week. Now, before we talk uh, trade targets, do you want to review our spicy takes from last week? Oh, yes. Let's do it. All right. I'll start with mine, which was um, a a big flop. (laughs) (laughs) Darcy Cameron to be the highest scoring ruck this round. Uh, Briggsy got him. Briggsy got him. Obviously, Tim English went huge as well. But look, he still did well. Um, I'd Yeah thought that the the matchup with Geelong and English might have reduced that ceiling yep. and obviously if Darcy Cameron put a couple more quarters like his second and fourth quarter I was going to say uh, been he might have got there but uh, <laughs> obviously yeah that one was a flop but I won't go ahead and give myself that one now I'm going to go ahead and give myself this one <laughs> just you know keeping with that motif of giving yourself a spicy take that's absolutely nowhere near but I said that McRae and Bailey Smith would both go sub 80 this week McRae turned up mate uh, yeah, but I, I've gone down the road of you and I'm just going to start giving myself these spicy takes. So the the, re- the reason why I'm mucking around, of course, but the reason why I've started to think that is is just like, what were we expecting? Is we were expecting Trelaw to come back in and we were expecting um, CBA percentage to come down for McRae and Well, we Smith. thought that Trelaw might be eased in and maybe do a bit more of that wing or half forward or half He was certainly not But he was in straight back in CBAs there. Yeah. And so yeah. we did see that just in fine Bevo form. Yep. Um, the roles changed straight back away. So, yeah. like, if, if you if you own uh, McRae or Bailey Smith, you obviously 
got that forward status, which is awesome. Uh, but week to week, man. They're probably going to be 90s, 95. Yeah, they'll be close enough to the mark. Maybe nearly 100. Man, but imagine riding that Bevo roller coaster, eh? Yeah, not, not, not a ride you want to be on. Okay, so in summary, our spicy takes... Uh, let's <laughs> yeah, let's not, instead not for spicy talk trade targets. This trade is targets. Spicy week. We've got guys coming off their buy. All right. So guys coming off their buy, you'll notice on these trade targets, they're all going to be um, they're all going to be round twelve players because this is the um, this is the strategy, right? You, you get a guy coming off their buy, they're going to contribute for the rest of the buy rounds. Yep. Um, and they're going to help you increase the amount of total players you have for the rest of the buys. Now we'll start going through defenders. I've got four names on this list, okay? And we're going to sort of talk about, like, as well, where we see them fitting in terms of, like, the best 22. Okay. Uh, and whether you think they're, in, they're like the, in there, they're locked in. The best fantasy 22 or the best at their team? The best fantasy 22. So Overall. Like, like your, your Roll. Roy's role in 22 oh, or whatever. that's copyright, mate. You Shout can't. out to the traders. <laughs> Shout out to the traders. <laughs> I was just trying to work out whether you're talking about their actual football team or whether... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Like, the fantasy, the best 22 okay. that we want to have, ideally, in yeah. our teams by the end of the year. So, okay. in the me. defenders, uh, I'll throw maybe these first two names at you. Okay. Jack Sinclair yep. and Hayden Young. What okay. are your thoughts on those boys? And, and do you have a pick out of the two? Uh, my pick would be Sinclair. Yeah. Um, but let me preface yeah, everything we say about defenders here. I really only think there's a couple of guys locked into that top six defender bracket. Mm. I, I feel like those remaining three or four spots are just like... Well, let's, let's do one off the cuff here. Like if we, <laughs> okay. if we did top six, yep. like I think locked, locked away you've got Dawson, Dawson Dacos, Dacos, Doherty. Doherty, the three Ds. Would yeah. you put Sicily in there? Um, Locked in. If if what he said the other week about his role it's is true, true, yes. Yeah. I think Easily. he would be my fourth. Yeah. So you've got four. And then who do you put as those next two right now? Do you put Sinclair as that next one? So this is where, this is where you can have a, a clump, right? And this yeah. is where you can talk about players being in and around the mark. I think you've got Tom Stewart who will be in and around the mark. I think Sinclair will be in and around the mark. Um, Zebel has a potential to be there. Hayden Young, I do think, has a potential to be there. Will Day, Sheasel are probably six guys that have to fit into that last two spots. Luke Ryan's averaging, buddy. Luke Ryan, yeah. Well, we'll talk about him in a second. But I think there's probably at least six to seven, maybe eight players that could fit in that last two spots. So I think Sinclair and Hayden Young are there. They're by no means guys that are locked into that yeah, you know, the, I think there's four, like we said, but they're there and about. If I, that makes sense, if that like uh, at least in my head, it kind of like illustrates the priority of how much urgency we should be trying to get these guys in there. If if you don't have Sicily in your team, are you targeting a different position this week and waiting for Sicily to come off his round fourteen buy and bringing him in? Potentially, because he so he comes back for one week. His break even is at. 55. So you'd have to think he's going to go up significantly. But if we think if we think that he's locked into that role where he doesn't have to be accountable, then bro, he's like he's going to be a top six defender. You would think. Yeah, I think so. I, I would I would definitely think so. So would you prioritize bringing in, let's say, like a Lockie Neal or a Sarong this week and targeting those kind of guys, and then thinking, okay, well, I do my defenders. Uh, I I do agree that there's probably more certainty in terms of like best twenty two guys in the mid midfielders coming off their buy this round. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of, like, Sinclair averaged 103 last year yeah. um, and had a big second half of the year. So I think that of all of them, he's probably got the highest ceiling of those guys and potential to join that sort of clear top three or four defenders. But the inclusion of um, uh, Wangling Manera going into defence, I think has sort of... I, I got through that well, mate. <laughs> you always butcher that, <laughs> I eight. did. Um, Valeria. NAW. Um, I think he, he's kind of limited the ceiling of Sinclair, although okay. we have seen it. He scored that 140 a couple of weeks ago, um, but it's just been a lot of like 90s and low 100s so far this season, which might still be enough. He's averaging 96. I think he could probably get close to 98 to 100 um, for the rest of the season. But it's not like clear have to move heaven earth to get this guy in, if that yeah. makes sense. No, I agree with that. Now, um, Frio boys, I can't believe we're still bloody selling the Hayden Young ticket, but, but Hayden Young well, and Luke Ryan. A couple, a couple of smokies. I'll, I'll look, look these next two guys together. Luke Ryan and Jake Lloyd. I'll also throw in there as well. He's coming yeah. off his bike. These guys, I would... They're unique. They're points of difference. Yeah. Luke Ryan obviously has his ceiling. He started the year off amazingly. 
Um, I would put them a little bit behind like your Sinclairs and Hayden Youngs. And he's actually pretty much the exact same price. 1K more than a Hayden Young. Um, but he's obviously probably going to be a little bit more unique. He hasn't had as many floor games compared to someone like a Hayden Young. But historically, when we look at Luke Ryan, he actually has a ceiling and he has a pretty low floor as well. So yeah. he's a guy that comes with a bit of risk. But being a point of difference, they've got Richmond this week. Um, their run home is okay for the rest of the season. But he is definitely someone that, I, if you told me at the end of the season that Luke Ryan was a top six defender, I wouldn't be completely shocked. Yeah. I'd be a little bit surprised, but it wouldn't completely shock me. And then Jake Lloyd is the other guy in that discussion. Again, just from a more unique point of view, he's a guy that's obviously done 110 in the past, but hasn't been that the last couple of years. Um, he's coming off the back of a 123 against Carlton. So his break-even is low-ish, 806000 Again, all very much in a similar 800 k kind of price tag. It's more just that unique matchup. Yeah. And for, he has the Saints this week as well. I mean, that that does make that somewhat tempting. But I think the thing, and I, I don't really have stats to back this up off the top of my head, but Sydney are looking to bounce off halfback a little bit more, less chippy-chippy. And I yeah. think, I actually think um, there's other guys that are taking more kick-ins this year. Am I right? Because Lloyd took predominantly... Uh, yeah, I think uh, the Lizard Blakey. is doing a bit of that. I see he signed um, until 2031. What's that, sorry? Did you see that the Lizard signed until 2031? Oh, did he? Yeah, that's a massive signing. Oh, good man. I don't know what I'm having for lunch tomorrow, and he's signed until 2031. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Okay, They've got to lock that one down. He's a key part of their team. Yeah, bro. Um, sure. I'll, I'll look up the kicking stats right now. But yeah. I think I think those are guys that you could do worse that if you maybe say you've got already a Sinclair or a Hayden Young, which I don't think many people would, but um, you could do worse in getting a lot of those boys in there. But I think they're the only real ones that we're targeting So while, the defenders. So while Mitch gets those kicking stats, we'll uh, turn our attention to some midfielders because this is where I'm turning my attention to this week in terms of trade-in targets. Now, again... Keeping with the motif, we're talking about guys coming off their round 12 buy. And at the top of this list, if you don't own this fella, we think that this guy is going to be top eight, if not a top four uh, midfielder throughout the rest of the year. And that is Andrew Brayshaw. So he, I'm assuming, coming off his buy is a guy that you do move a little bit of heaven and earth to get to. Is that right? Uh, Yes, I do agree. Just to go on those kicking numbers that I was looking at before, it is like a three-way split between Nick Blakey, Lloyd and Florent. Blake is actually taking the most so yeah. far this season. Pretty close with Jake Lloyd and then Florent just takes a few each game. So okay. probably not good signs for him returning to the Jake Lloyd of old. Yeah. Uh, but yes, Andrew Brayshaw. Yes, I have him currently at the moment. I've recently just done my my 22. I currently have Andrew Brayshaw as the third highest averaging midfielder from here to the rest of the season and a lock for the best 22. So I think that... Whilst I don't think he's value right now, he's priced at 116. Yeah. Value at this point of the season is less important, especially You're just because for that, that guy off his buy that you don't have. Yeah, the guy off the buy. If you want like the consistency, the certainty that you're going to get a guy that you're going to want in your side, he's going to stay there. You don't have to touch him for the rest yep. of the season. Then Andrew Brasher, I think, is the number one option out of any position. Um, coming well, off their round 12 buy. Since he decided, was it his calf? Since he decided that his calf wasn't an issue uh, knee. anymore. Knee. Yep. He's got 113, 157, 105, 135, 103. Yeah, I can't think the other day. He's averaging 135 since I brought him in, so I'm pretty happy with that trade. But a little head wobble there. <laughs> but he is a guy that can go on big runs. He's got Richmond yep. this week um, and does have a couple of tasty matchups. In the final couple of weeks, he goes um, West Coast, Port and Hawthorne. So two really good matchups in the last three weeks there. So I think he's a guy that, yeah, like I sort of said, lock in for the top eight and um, potentially the top four as well for the midfielders. So he's a one that if you can get to him, he is expensive. But if you can get there, I wouldn't mind it. Um, and again, value at this point of the season is less important. The next guy here I want to talk about here is a little bit cheaper, Lockie Neal. Who yeah, this might be the guy that I'm going after this week, Mitch, and I don't know whether I like it or not. Let me sell you a bit on Nike Neal because I'm quite I'm quite keen on the move. Um, I just really don't like Brisbane. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll share. Other than living, I'll, like I'll, it's a fantastic place to live. The team, the don't footy get me team. Wrong. Uh, look, I'll share your sentiment there, but I think that well, I'm sorry to any Brisbane supporters out there. We just uh, you know have our own team over here that we support. But look at his run coming up. Hawthorne this week. Juicy. We saw what Port Adelaide did to Hawthorne. Yeah. He then goes Sydney, which, okay. But then after this, look at this. You've got St. Kilda, Richmond, West Coast, three in a row. 
Um, then goes up against Melbourne, Geelong, tough matchup, Gold Coast and Frio, who are also giving up really big scores. Okay. And then finishes the year with Adelaide, Collingwood and St Kilda again. So okay, okay, I got in, that. I got that hardwood back <laughs> in that yeah, run. Right. If we talk about Hawthorne, St Kilda, Richmond, West Coast, Frio, Frio. and St Kilda, he's got six super easy games How can in he not the next in those ten games, right? games. So over half his schedule of the next, well, the next part of the season is what we would call to again borrow from the traders <laughs> the mega green side of things <laughs> um, what's he what's he priced at in terms of like a points um, figure because he's 820 I believe so he's priced at 97 or 98 points he, he goes at like a 103 to 105 I'd have to say he's at least 100 um, I'm a little bit Worried that he's not the Lockie Neal that junks up as much as he did in the past. So I don't think he's necessarily like the 108, 110 guy which you've seen in the past. But yeah, he potentially to be like a 103, 105 guy. He, There's a bit over, of value there. Over that stretch that you just talked about, if he if he gives you that kind of 103, you're yeah. happy with that because then later down the track when you get the opportunity to, to go to the big dog that you missed, you, you can probably bridge that gap. Am I right yeah. in saying that? I, I do agree. I do agree. So I think I think for me, if, if you can't afford Brayshaw or you already have him... Lockie Neal, to me, is the number two guy that okay. I would be targeting him, and I am potentially looking at him this week myself as well. If I, just selfishly again, if I can get Greenwood to Neal, you tick that off? I'll tick that off. That's an upgrade for sure. Regardless of what I have to do to get it? Well, <laughs> no. I'm not going to just blanket statement saying English, yes. down the bricks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I think if you can, you know, move some undesirable pieces out of your team okay. to do that, then yeah, I think that's a good good play. Okay. Let's let's compare a Lockie Neal to this next player here in Jack Steele, oh, who man. is actually he, not that much more expensive. This this uh, is the craziest thing, isn't it? And I've heard other people talk about this uh, on their podcast as well. Yeah. It's like, why is Jack Steele not just the guy that everyone should be targeting <laughs> off this buy? Like, yeah. if you yeah, ask yeah. at the start of the year, okay, you know, you ha- you don't have Steele at, at his round twelve buy. Okay, well he is. You, you, you pay twenty more, twenty k more than a Lockie <laughs> Neal, and you can get Jack Steele. He's the Fuck name yeah. of lights. I'm getting it? Jack like, Steele. Hell you yeah. Do it. So. Why am I not doing that? Um, well, two reasons. Number one, you want to. He's had some injury concerns, yeah. and he, yes, he he's had his buy around. But I think there was talk was it a medial or something like that, or a PCL oh, or but something that wasn't like anything to sort of brush to the side. It was mate, a decent injury he's, that he's nursing. He's still a very good player. We gotta get those crickets. <laughs> we gotta get those crickets. So yes, he had those injuries, and he did come out and did. Uh, was it a one twenty one yeah, against yeah. Giants a couple of weeks ago? But then the next round, he comes up and does a seventy eight. The game before that, he does a seventy five and sits out that last quarter against Adelaide. Remember that. So with ice on his knee. So, so there's a little bit of a concern around his health at the moment. He comes into a matchup against Sydney, Sydney. who's one of the tougher matchups of the round and he also has a break even of 125 the other thing to consider as well is that because this round that we're on right now round 13 only has two teams on it next week we're probably still going to be looking at all these round 12 players again anyway have a look so chances are you're going to be looking at two of these guys so if you if the answer is if the question is like in what order do you get them in you get Neil this week with a break even of 80 coming up against the Hawks yeah over a steal coming up against Sydney with a break even of one twenty five, and concerns about his knee and health and all that sort of stuff. That yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Let me throw you a hypothetical. We get you get Neil this week. Yep. Steel comes out, w- smashes it. Well, or this is the hypothetical. What does he have to do to make him a trade target for you next week? Do you know what I mean? What does he have to score? What can't he score? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I, I want to use the eye test over okay. scores. Right. Um, so I want to look at him, make sure he's running well and getting um like his marks and spreading and yeah. and you know sprinting confidently and all that kind of thing. Um, if you want to boil it down to some numbers, I want to see his time on ground start to come up a little bit. His last three games, he's gone seventy five percent, seventy seven percent, sixty six percent, seventy nine percent. His last four games. Uh, whereas the start of the year, he was close to that 80% time on ground. So if I see that number on time on ground closer to 80% than 70%, then I'm going to feel more comfortable doing it. Okay. Um, and ideally, if he, you know, I'm not so worried. If he scores a 90 or a 100, I'm still okay if those other boxes are ticked. If those other boxes are ticked and he scores a 60, then maybe not. I still wait a little bit and go for something else. Um, but yeah, I think... 
that's the way I look at it. So, yeah. Oh, Does that answer your question? Yeah, he could be he could be that pick that just hits your home run if he gets that continuity, it could. couldn't he? Like he could go and average one twenty. So, um, in the interest of time, another yep. couple of mids that we've got here: um, Sarong and then a teammate, Matthew Johnson. They're kind of on either ends of the spectrum in terms of Sarong's an upgrade, Johnson downgrade. Yeah, so Sarong is kind of kind of like that alternative to uh, a Brayshaw, Neil, and Steele. He's the he's the guy that's obviously done really well this season, priced at nine hundred, I think. What's his? Yeah, nine hundred and twenty-two thousand. So, uh, between the price points of a Steel and a Brayshaw, kind of that middle guy. Yeah. I think he again, if we're talking about the rolling twenty-two, I don't know if he's in there, but he's a chance to definitely end up there by season's end. He's priced at a hundred and nine right now. So, whilst I don't think he's value, maybe like a Neil or a Steel, there's probably he's probably closer to the top eight than a Neil is, and has less question marks than a Jack Steel does. So if those other two players don't float your boat and you've got a brace already, <coughs> then Sarong would be the other guy that I'd be okay bringing in this week as well. And you've got an extra 100k. And Matthew Johnson, like we talked about before, yep. he's kind of that downgrade or sideways trade that I think he's going to be there. I think Jaeger Amir is suspended for round 13. So I think Johnson's at least going to be there this week and should get a decent, at least some midfield role. Um, so I think he is the guy that should make a little bit of money. Hopefully he, again, fingers crossed that he holds his spot um, for these next couple of weeks and he's there for the next couple of buy rounds. But he's the kind of guy that if I can downgrade to him and do the upgrade on the other end, he'd be the guy I'd be going for. Amira, yeah, suspended. Yeah. Uh, forwards. forwards. Now, don't don't tell me you're going to turn around and trade Errol Gilden in. I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to, <laughs> but I don't think I can. So uh, I probably won't be doing it. I think he's very expensive. Uh, Josh Dunkley, if you don't have him, is also probably a good purchase as well because we talked about that run for Neil. Dunkley obviously has the same run. So those guys are, are kind of more or less obvious. If you haven't had them all season, now is probably the time you try and get them in. Now, the last name that you've got here, on, do, do you want to talk about this name? or I do, I do. Okay. Nat, well, we, you well, Nat of, Fife. You floated it on the couch on the weekend and I told you you were crazy, but... Yeah. He's Justify. Four, he's 445000 um, That's cheap. He's a Brownlow medalist. It's cheap. He is someone who's only 100000 more than a Matthew Johnson, who's obviously an untested, untried rookie. He's been slowly building up his time on ground, slowly building up um, the midfield role. And I think that the experiment of the forward, at least permanent forward role is over. I think he still splits a little bit forward and mid. Yeah, but I think he still gets a little bit more run in the midfield. So, so for people listening, people go, "Oh, Mitch is Mitch has gone crazy." But talk about the, the scenario where you'd look at this. What, like, why would you go down this road? What do you see it being for you? The scenario that you look at this is that you look at your forward line, you see five or six round fifteen by players, <laughs> <laughs> and you go, "Fuck, who's going to play in my forward line in round 15? Do I want to trade in? A Dylan Moore? Do I want to trade in uh, a Ben Keys or someone like that? I mean, maybe you do, but again, those guys are going to cost you way more than a Nat Five. Is um, Keys going to cost you? Keys is six hundred now. Six hundred, two hundred k more. So a Nat Five is a cheap option that has the potential to score an eighty or a ninety. And on it's just one of those right get day. you through the buy things. It's not. It's he's not an upgrade. He's not a. He's not a guy. It's like one of those sideways moves, or even like a downgrade. Say you downgrade a Fiorini or an Atkins to an At Five or something yeah. like that. You're getting a player that's forward eligible that has the potential to do something in the right role. If he doesn't go crazy like what happened to go with me, his it's score drops off. It doesn't count. You true. haven't lost all that much. I still don't feel good about it, but at the end of the day, you've got to. I don't feel good about it. Maybe it's not even a this week play. It might be a next week play because his break even is still 79. So even if he comes out and scores a ton, he's not going up very much. Um, But then you would have the confidence to jump into it. So he might be a watch this week and a trade in next week. But just someone that I want to be on everyone's radar as uh, maybe a potential solution, a cheap solution for your round 15 forward issues. Yeah, Um, just flagging it. Nothing wrong with that. Now, we're making a habit of these long podcasts, aren't we? But should we... Um, we love the buy rounds, don't we? We do. Should we jump on um, Twitter and... We did have some questions space? and some ones that I think are worth going over. So, we talked about Ben Keys before. Yeah. Let's also lump in a Briggs into the situation as okay. well. These guys that obviously went gangbusters last week yep. are cheap compared to what they're going to produce. Is it too late to get in a Keys or a Briggs? Well, the, I think they're, they're slightly different uh, when we talk about them in the fact that uh, Briggs is Positional. on the ruck line. Yeah, so yeah. there's 
there's no way that I feel like I'd be endorsing somebody going, if you've got the Marshall English combo, I wouldn't be endorsing just randomly trading, trading one of these guys. Briggs, and yeah. I also wouldn't be endorsing trying to get Briggs in a yard or three or no, anything. I, wouldn't well. I think that would just yeah. completely fuck your team up. But um, if you've got one of those, you know, spicier picks in the ruck line and you felt like that, that ruckman wasn't going to be the guy that you're going to see through, maybe there's a cash grab where you downgrade someone to Briggs and then ride this cash run a little bit and then get it up to English or Marshall later. Like, do you see a scenario there where you, you don't have English or Marshall? <clears throat> let's say you've got, let's say you've got like Wits. A Wits, this yeah. This week. He's on the buy. So so what would be wrong with going, like you've got Marshall and Wits, you go Wits down to Briggs to ride this cash, you get a playing player this week and then you try and at some point then get to English. Um, the risk is that obviously you've got Wits, he's got the pot buy, uh, round 13 buy round. Yeah. Um, he would have helped you around 15 when both English and, and Briggs. Briggs are on their buy round. Yeah. So you would need to make sure that you plan that well enough and you've got, and again, we look at our forward lines and that sort of stuff for the round yep. 15. Make sure that buy round isn't catastrophic, but okay. theoretically that play would work. And you'd be okay having Briggs even into round 16, I think. Based seems, on what I've seen, he, he's still... Seems really solid, It, it he? looks like he's going to be okay. So it's not the worst case scenario if he's still in your team after the buy rounds and then you get him up to uh, an English or whatever like that um, afterwards. But it's just that round 15 buy yeah. is awkward. <laughs> and yeah, I just don't know what kind of rucks you've got there that you might be doing it. So, like you yeah. said, if you've already got English and Marshall, I probably wouldn't endorse the move from Darcy to Briggs last last week. That was that was that the was move. the play. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's so uh, a fellow with a so let's talk about keys. Uh, yeah, with a more friendly buy round is is Keezy. Um, hurt me a li- little bit this week because I got Greenwood instead of Keys. I never had the the um, cash to get to Keys anyway. It was really because yeah, you want to do Laird as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but look, the the black and white answer is. If Keys is in that role for the rest of the year, then absolutely, it is definitely not too late to jump on that. Well, he, he could be a, he could be a top six guy, which is um, insanity, but at a really cheap price. But what? So let's talk. Let's actually talk about how Adelaide have played when Keys is in the midfield, because I actually think that there might be something to the fact that they actually haven't. Well, they um, lost. Been performing as well. Yeah, they lost. they lost. Did they lose last week as well? Actually, let me have a look at that. Let me double check. Um, My memory is so short. Do, do, do. So they versus the Suns and they versus Brisbane. No, they beat Brisbane. So they beat Brisbane. They did beat Brisbane. Yeah, okay. The and other game that they played him in the midfield was against Collingwood and I think they lost to Collingwood. So... But, but the short answer is, like, and you would agree, absolutely yes, you've got to get this guy in if you think that he's going to play that midfield role for the rest of the year. I, I would say it's almost like a must trade in. So he's gone, he's gone into the midfield for what reason? He's gone in there to... He's locked in Matty Rowell. Last round. Yeah. Bigger bodied Brisbane midfield. The round before he he was with Neil at Stoppages. Yeah. Okay. Again, Brisbane have got a probably a bigger midfield than most other teams in the comp. Yeah. Um and the other time that he went in the middle was to tag Dacos when he went into the middle. It was kind of like a reaction because he started on Dacos yeah. in the, the the defensive line. Dacos went into the middle, Keys just kind of followed him in. His next couple of games, he comes up against the Eagles. Well, who's he tagging at the Eagles? Yeah, you wouldn't have thought um, so. I wouldn't have thought he's, he's tagging in there. He's the good buy then, obviously. And then he's got West, uh, Collingwood again. So say he goes to Dacos again. Again, you maybe got a bit of that cat and mouse kind of thing. Does Dacos yeah. play defense or mid? Maybe he might go in mid if, if he's there. So would, you, so would you wait one more week? And if it happens again against the Eagles, then you think, oh, shit, maybe this is a thing? Yeah, if he's in there against the Eagles, then he's obviously not doing a tagging job. He's just in there because he's their third or fourth but mid. I'd love to hear Adelaide um, fans' perspective on this, but I think they look a better team when Rochelle's in there. I agree. Like um, they were doing so well at the start of the year when it was Rochelle, when it was um, Saligo, when it was um, Keezy. Keezy's a gun. Other like, young, young guys. Keezy's a gun, but Keezy's like in that accumulator lead type role where he just he bullies people, he gets the footy, yeah. racks the pill up, but Rochelle might have less possessions. They anyway, use it just, better, yeah. yeah. And they, so, they're more damaging. Yeah, if Bowles, if Bowles is watching this, I'd be interested to get his thoughts. Um, but yeah. So I, my, my opinion as like a blanket rule is that you don't go... If you, if you didn't get him last week, you don't get him this, this week. week yeah. I'd rather be trying to prioritise getting that upgrade to a round 12 buy player because again, similar to what we said before about those other guys, if he goes big, yes, he's going to go up in cash and his break even is low at 25. So he will make money. But then you've at least got the certainty that he's in there as a midfielder moving forward. Yeah. And he's still going to be cheap for what he could potentially oh, do. Like he's, he's, he's he was down like 300,000 before last week. Yeah. 
So you've still got uh, a cheaper forward that you can put in there. I would just want another week to make sure that's the case. And then the guys who did get him in, he's got his buy. They've got the dilemma of, do I keep him? Do I trade him on his buy? What do I do? Yeah, true. Um, you avoid that dilemma. And if he's the guy that you want after the buy round at round 15, then you get him. So yeah. for mine, I think you wait. Yeah, you could even do like a She's Laws Evil down. Yeah, um, you could. Yeah, yeah. the, the round point, after because yeah. yeah, he's he's going to be still at that point cheaper, much so cheaper no, than than a Sheasel. You can make some cash. You can make some cash while and one's he, going up, that, one's going down. And in that role, he'll average more than Sheasel, and, and you'll have more certainty. You'll yeah. have more certainty by then. Look, it was a it was a great play last week oh, because anyone play. you got in, you had that buy around dilemma. Yeah. Um, but this week, I don't like it as much. Now, there's a scenario where I'm wrong, and obviously, if you jump on, it does prove to be a great pick. He yep. suits your buy rounds. He helps around 15 forward line. Great if you're set up well there. But I think the general opinion I have is that probably it was a last week, not this week yeah. play. Oh, he could um, he could be the keys to success. So you, you never know. We'll see. Um, All right. That was that was the lowest of low hanging fruit. <laughs> that was a good one, I thought. Uh, all uh, right, do we have any other questions? Let's. Uh, a lot of them we have covered them already. Uh, I'll extend that same sort of discussion to Darcy Cameron. Is he still a good option? I think we've kind of already answered that. That I'd probably prefer to wait after the buy rounds. Yeah, and and I think uh, yeah, we kind of brought it up before. I, I'm looking at it as a potential play after he comes off his buy now, um, especially if I can make it as like a cash grab from from a sheasel or something like that. If I'm looking to get off him, so yep. Good one, one more name that I'll throw at you um, that we haven't discussed that a few people are wanting to know. Chad Warner has another guy coming up his buy round. Um, midfielder, 831000 So he's actually more expensive than a Lockie Neal. Some people are asking him or Lockie Neal. I'm Lockie Neal 10 days out of 10. Yeah, it's like it's interesting. So he's gone since round 7, 113, 99, 104, 115, 105, which is kind of similar to what Neal's done in terms of overall. Neal had one little stinker in that period, but... I don't know. Is it the is it the pedigree of Lockie Neal that gets you across the line? I think it is, is the it? pedigree. I mean, we've seen him, you know, put up a couple of really poor scores. He's got three scores under sixty five so far this year. Yeah. The ceiling also isn't super high. Like his highest score of the year is one hundred and fifteen. Oh, sorry, one hundred and seventeen in round one. Yeah. So when you've got a floor under sixty five and a ceiling not over one twenty, they're just not the kind of players that I prefer to jump on. His Run coming up is good. Um, St Kilda this week, then Lions, then West Coast, then Geelong, then Richmond. So three out of the f- next five are good. Yeah. Two are probably tougher. But I'm just he's again he's falls in that category of more impact, less accumulator kind of player. And I just rather a Lockie Neal because um, at the start of the season I had him higher projected than I did a Chad Warner. So I'll uh, I'll go that guy when they're the same price. Sure. But that uh, that might do it us there, man. I, I think there's a few more questions, but I think we've answered them a lot during the podcast as okay. well. So hopefully, if you have any other questions, we can um, we'll go through them on the uh, Friday live show when we do our our yeah. podcast with beers in hand. Hopefully, I'll be feeling a little bit better now. We we got a oh, you got through well, yeah, an hour and twenty two. Um, so daytime podcasts are dangerous. We just ran <laughs> on. We've got, right. we got nowhere to be. Yeah, that's it, mate. Right. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for those who have tuned in. Make sure you give this uh, video a big thumbs up if you're watching over on YouTube. If you are also watching on YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe. And as well, if you're listening on the podcast, feel free to drop a rating and review wherever you're listening to it if you've enjoyed the in-season content as well. And uh, we'll see you guys on Friday for our live show. Until then, laters. Yeah.